You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Hey, I'm Steve Englehart, and you're listening to the Epic Marvel Podcast. Hello, welcome back to the Epic Marvel Podcast. This is West Coast Avengers Episode 1C, sort of tangentially uh, covering a period of West Coast Avengers from 1985 to 1986. I'll explain that in a minute. But I am your host, Curtis Findlay. And I am your Avengers West Coast co-host, Josh Tan. And what issues are we talking about today? Well, today we are actually discussing a sister series to the uh, beginning of West Coast Avengers of Vision and the Scarlet Witch. Uh, They had a 12-issue limited series at the same time that West Coast was launched. Today we're discussing issues 3 through 12 of that series because we've already talked about 1 and 2 in in the previous episode. Yeah, and so I think that listeners, you probably should go back... And listen to episode 1B if you haven't already, because that is where this starts. Um, I will say, though, however, uh, if you just read issues numbers 3 to 12, you're actually fine. I mean, they do Mm -hmm. reference it. Uh, uh, Maybe that's bad. I I think you should read the other ones, because the whole series kind of has a nice bookend at the end when we get the return of some of the villains we meet at the beginning. So... uh, yeah, I kind of think you do need to read issues one and two plus West Coast Avengers issue one as well to get the full story. Mm-hmm. But we've already talked about that. We're going to leave that in the past and we're going to move into uh, what we haven't talked about so far. Yeah, we didn't want to leave these just hanging out there. We we figured we should discuss them because, you know, the, the, the books start off together and then they both go on their separate journeys. But Uh, As West Coast Avengers continues, uh, you know, some of the elements from this series play into that uh, main series. So it's probably good that, you know, we discuss it. Now, we probably should say that this isn't in an epic collection officially. Right. That this is uh, a trade paperback. I mean, the one that we're looking at is, uh, well, let's see, what year was this from? 2002. 13 or 14 uh avengers vision and the scarlet witch a year in the life yeah mine's from um 2010 i wonder if mine's a yes, first print- what... yeah mine's a first printing 2010 yep that's Avenger- what i have here it says avengers vision and the scarlet witch a year in the life there is another trade coming out as of this recording it isn't quite out yet but it'll be out in a couple of months called vision and the scarlet witch the saga of vision and wanda and it collects this 12-issue series plus the four-issue limited series, The Vision and Scarlet Witch, that came a few years before this that has to do with the beginning of their relationship. Uh, and so they've kind of put that together. I think there might be a few odds and ends issues in there as well that have to do with the two of them together. Mm-hmm. But there are options. But yeah, I mean, this being a 12-issue limited series, like when you're putting together the epic collections, are you going to stick a 12 issue limited series in an epic collection? Because that's literally half the book right there. In fact, that's more than right. half the book. Um, I, I can understand that we've had four issue series and we've had even a six issue limited series with um, Origin in one of the Wolverine epic collections. But uh, to give this to give this much real estate to a limited series is right. something that we haven't seen yet. Uh, so... Yeah, and we and we can tell already tell because volume three and volume four of the West Coast Avengers epics are uh, we, we know what the contents of those are and these last issues three to twelve are nowhere to be seen. Right. Right. Yep. Well, I asked on Facebook if we could get some uh, comments about this mini series here, and I got one comment from uh, J C Carlos. Uh, it's a long comment, so that makes up for the fact that we didn't get anything else. <laughs> um, Great. So I'm going to read what he says here. Um, there are a few spoilers in this comment, so if you don't want to be spoiled as to some of the events, if you are uh, if you are kind of reading piece by piece and listening along with the episode, you might may want to just skip ahead a couple minutes here. But JC says, 
Things that I liked about this book, that it took place over 12 months. Rarely do we get a handle on the passage of time in the Marvel Universe, but this 12-issue uh, limited series give a, gives us a look at the year in the lives of our heroes, something that he did like. He also says, I can think of at least two other 12-issue series, Squadron Supreme and DC's Batman The Long Halloween, that did this as well. That's that's interesting. Uh, he says, mm -hmm. I liked that we get, got to see the heroes trying to lead normal lives outside of, the, uh, outside of going on missions or patrolling for muggers. There's no shortage of action, but we do get a good helping of domestic bliss in this series, which was unique for the time. I don't know why I liked seeing Captain America and Magneto at a dinner party together, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He says, as a kid buying this off the rack, I was particularly excited to own the first appearance of new Marvel characters, glamour and illusion. A anytime I'd find myself in possession of a first appearance, I'd have visions of selling the book some years down the line for hundreds of dollars if the characters took off. Uh, this obviously wasn't one of those times. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I've got a lot to say about glamour and illusion. They are interesting characters. I uh, I agree with uh, what he's saying with the um, the overall moments of yeah, we get some superhero action in every issue, but then there's those the moments really do deal with yeah that kind of okay we're married we're we're you know going down that road together and okay let's have a house and then kind of following some of that um, family not. I wouldn't say troubles per se, but the family dynamics where, oh, okay, I got to deal with your brother-in-law and, <laughs> and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, man. There's so much going on with both of these family groups. Their their lineages are just so weird. And, mm -hmm. and to have them married and have, you know, the father, the, the you know, the, the vision side of the family that has to deal with... Um, Simon Williams and um, and, and Grim Reaper and, and Ultron. And then the yep. other side of the family that has to deal with Magneto and Inhumans. <laughs> like, holy cow, it's so strange. <laughs> it is. Um, but and, and what's great about it is, it, and we've talked about this before, how Steve Englehart does this. I mean, it, it, it absolutely continues to humanize these characters just, and that's always been the cornerstone of Marvel, but, but, but now you're dealing with how, you know, basically crystal of the inhumans was also Scarlet Witch's sister-in-law. And it's just weird to see her labeled as such because you're, you know, you're not used to seeing her labeled as such. And it's yeah. just kind of a, an interesting um, overall dynamic, different dynamics in this book we get to see. So JC continues to go on. He says, I really like the randomness that Wanda and Vision make friends with another couple that happen to be, have superpowers. Only this couple made an active decision not to risk their lives battling alien menaces or mutant terrorists. Uh, and here's some of the spoilers if you want to skip ahead a couple minutes here. These two decided to use their powers for a stage act and then to top it off, they're secretly international jewel thieves, a subplot that never gets addressed or resolved in this series. And I'm okay with it, he says. Chekhov's gun doesn't always have to come back and be fired in the second act. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting thing to, to point out, and I think I'll talk about that more when we get to the end of this series. Yes. Uh, he says, I was also glad to see Vision reflect on his relationship with Simon Williams, as well as the unofficial Invaders reunion. Uh, that kind of reflection doesn't usually get the time it deserves or needs in a book like The Avengers. And I think that's partly because of the. this is a 12-issue limited series, so um, the, the plot, the overall plot, I think, is thin which means that it leaves more room for those kind of moments. Okay, JC says, things I didn't like. The art. Howell's pencils never really grabbed me. I put them in a tier with Al Milgram's pencils, so somewhere near the bottom for my taste. And that's funny because Al Milgram was the penciler for West Coast Avengers at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, that I think Howell really depends on the inker he has, because uh, in the first in the first issue, the inks of Andy Mushinsky, uh, those are excellent. I really like uh, Richard Howell's work in that first issue. And mm -hmm. then after that, we get a series of rotating inkers. Like, there's no one consistent until we get to the last few issues, and and Frank Springer is the inker. And right. I'm not a huge Frank Springer fan in general, and so I think that it actually does a disservice to Richard Howell's pencils. So I'm not sure if maybe the thing that uh, the thing that JC doesn't like is actually maybe the anchor paired with with Howell. Yeah, and we we had kind of discussed that last time how 
you know, if you know, of course, Joe Cinna, you know, he makes everybody look good. It, yeah. It's a shame for just 12, uh, 12 issues. He couldn't pull double duty or I <laughs> who knows, maybe, maybe triple duty. I don't know what else he was doing at the time, but uh, it would have been nice just because it's kind of a sister series to uh, West Coast Avengers at the time. It would have been cool just to get that cohesion. Um, Sinnott does do some of the covers. He inks some of the covers. I mean, if you look, especially the uh, the cover to issue number six, the mutant who came to dinner with the dinner party mm-hmm. and stuff, he is the inker on that one. So his hand is in this book a little bit. Nice. Uh, he also, JC also says, aside from his drawing, I also wish Howell would have drawn Wanda and, Vi- and Vision in regular street clothes a bit more, especially since their motivations at the beginning of the series is to get out of the superhero biz. Yeah, I definitely would agree with that. Um, and we get a little bit more of that with Vision. But yeah, they're still, I mean, you know, they want... They want their neighbors to feel comfortable about them. You know, you think they would try to blend in a bit more. Yeah, or maybe it would just make it worse if he's got this big bright red face or something. I don't know. Right. I mean, if if they're just trying to do the the home life thing, I mean, you know, they could wear a pair of jeans and a t-shirt or something. I mean, it's, you know, lounging around the house. Why, you know, why are they wearing all their capes and everything else? And we eventually see that come into realization in the, when Vision gets his own series that happened just a few years ago when he has his own kind of Vision family. And he dresses yes. up in his just regular, you know, golf shirt or whatever and, and khaki pants. And uh, and there's also that great scene in, I think it's Infinity War, where um, Vision and Wanda are somewhere in Europe hiding out. And they're just dressed like normal people. Yeah. I think you get more of that modern day because of just sensibilities have changed. I think if people were picking this up, I I think they had to play up the superhero comic aspect of it or people would be like, oh, this looks boring. Yeah. You know, I'm sure that's what played into that. Well, but they still have like a guest star in each of one of these issues that could show up and and get featured on the cover with their superhero outfits or whatever. But yeah, you're probably right. Um, They kept them in there to to make it seem still like a superhero book. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, so JC wraps it up saying, I could go on, but I'm sure you want to keep the podcast to under 90 minutes, so I'll wrap up saying that I like the book (laughs) overall because it tried to be a bit different from other Marvel titles of the time, but the art kept it from being a favorite of mine. I think that's that's a fair assessment. I mean, the the artwork serves the story well enough. Uh, you know, there is some some moments of some storytelling. I would say this: um, uh, Howell at the time was was pulling double duty because he was working for DC at the same time as this. Oh, really? Um, in fact, there was yeah, there was an ongoing Hawkman series uh, at this same point in the mid to late eighties that uh, he was also the penciler of that. He also did Shadow War of the Hawkman, uh, which was a mini series just prior. So he was working a lot. Not that that, you know, should excuse, you know, subpar work. But, uh, I mean, he was cranking out pages, for, that's for sure. Well, I guess I should go and look at and see what his stuff is like when he's only on one title. Because there are some scenes, and I'll point them out if I remember, uh, where it's like the backgrounds are just completely absent. Because I'm sure he was just rushing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he still is a good storyteller. And especially the the one issue with... Uh, when Quicksilver, uh, when Crystal is in a coma and Quicksilver finds out about what she's been doing, it's like that is a, a really, really powerful issue. And I thought that it was quite uh-huh. well done. And I credit a lot of that to the, the pacing of of uh, Howell's pencils. Yeah. Richard and I were friends before we did any of this stuff. And I, you know, and I did know him and, and Carol um, socially and when I was on the East Coast, you know, whatever. He was not a demanding artist. You know, I would say, here's the story, and he would draw the story and make it better, but he wasn't trying to change it or or kibitz or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, I worked with him later at Claypool, the company that he started, doing another thing that I really <laughs> that I really like. I put in a pitch, if you can ever find it, Phantom of Fear City from Claypool was a series that I was very happy with later on and, and has rarely been seen because it was from claypool but Hmm. um yeah no richard and i um got along fine we just you know we'd get on the phone and and but he left it to me to to come up with the story so we didn't have to hash anything out or or anything like that so we'll have to go through and you know art is subjective so i'm not saying that jc is wrong at all because uh everyone has their own tastes but uh, i i was personally fine with this i think he's 
I don't know that I would put him in the same level as Al Milgram per se, but <laughs> <laughs> poor Al. I know, right? <laughs> I'm sure he's a. I'm sure he's a nice guy. Oh, I'm sure he is too. I just think that, um, <laughs> and it's his own fault. I mean, he was definitely trying to do as many pages as he could in order to get more money, sure. so to get a bigger paycheck. And that's what you do when you're freelance. Oh, yeah. So I don't fault him for that. <laughs> yep. Okay, let's move on to our talk here, talking about Vision and Scarlet Witch, starting with issue number three. This one's called Ancestors. In this first issue, we're going to talk about Vision and Scarlet Witch are drawn to New Salem. This is the start of a new story. Uh, we've kind of left the whole Ultron um, Wonder Man situation from the first two issues, and uh, and we're, we're off in a new direction. So mm -hmm. New Salem is calling. They just feel like they kind of need to go there. And when they get there, they're caught by the new Salem Seven, and they are going to be sacrificed uh, to the corn god during the Feast of Lamas, or Lamas. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce that. Uh, probably Lamas. I, that's that's how I read it. Okay. The, the Feast of Lamas. Yeah, and this all kind of has to do with Agatha Harkness, who was the person who um, trained Scarlet Witch a lot. And she, at the beginning of this issue, gets burned at the stake, uh, which mm -hmm. I thought was um, surprising, quite frankly. <laughs> I didn't expect to see that. Right. I um, And I, I forgot to actually research her storyline because obviously she's been around Marvel for quite a while. She's yep. starting with Fantastic Four. Um, yeah, I didn't know because that was my thing. The Salem Seven, I think, look awesome. I don't, I just don't know too much about them. And again, I know they started off with Fantastic Four, but to to getting them to this point in this issue with New Salem and everything, and, you know, jumping in fresh because I, I know nothing about these characters. Yeah, I don't know anything about them too. I didn't research them either. Maybe that's going to make our uh, for a bad podcast episode, but <laughs> uh, they're only around for a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This issue was interesting. Um, it it kind of drops you into the middle of a situation and we are taken along for the ride just as Vision and Scarlet Witch are. So they are confused with what's going on and therefore we are confused by what's going on. Uh, and frankly, there are so many characters. It was actually kind of, it didn't really make me care about the Salem Seven because they didn't really spend any sort of amount of time on any one character to make me care about this group of people at all. Right. Um, and whenever, uh, maybe you have this problem too, but every time I read a Marvel comic that has to do with any sort of demons or magic, I, I always feel like, well, this is a perfect Defenders issue. And that's what this kind of feels like. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that, That's a good point. Yep. I will say, though, that this is the issue where, I guess, in a way, uh, Scarlet Witch conceives. Yeah, she at one point, um, she actually, because she's going to be getting sacrificed, she actually destroys New Salem. Uh, by paneling or by channeling a, a massive surge of, uh, I guess they call it witch fire, and she was she was able to do that by by being guided by the spirit of Agatha Harkness. And when all that was said and done, and the smoke clears, uh, there's the, the final panel where she's kind of touching her stomach, and she goes, "Well, maybe." And that's that's yeah, we're led to believe. Okay, so in the witch fire in conjunction with her hex ability. Uh, you know, there was no uh, there was no hanky panky going on for this uh, pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like that's it's got to be so hard. Uh, Engel Engelhard has to be creative and trying to figure out how he's going to make this happen because you know, <laughs> right. um, the thing about Wanda's powers is that she can literally do anything. It's kind of a um, deus ex machina kind of a power it's like you get into a situation and then you just say oh Scarlet Witch can get us out with quote unquote magic <laughs> or hex powers mm -hmm. and that kind of saves the day so and that's what's happening here like yep it's just magic there's no need to explain it it's just the way it is um, one thing we should mention and, and it becomes more prevalent as we go forward into these issues they were kind of set up where they actually were a month in between just about. And the 12 issues, you know, they call this collection a year in the life. Uh, it actually does follow somewhat real time. And it's great because, you know, you have a nine month pregnancy. And so that takes us from issues four to 12. 
Mm -hmm. And so these, this third issue is the month before conceiving. And then the first two issues, they actually kind of go back to back. They're not really a month apart. So it's not technically a yeah. whole year, but it's close enough. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Once she's pregnant. Yeah. Then they really track it month by month of the pregnancy, uh, which I think was unique and different, uh, especially considering, you know, you could have five monthly issues that actually take place in one night, you know, depending right. on the story. Yeah, totally. Well, that was only going to be a 12-issue series. I mean, the West Coast Avengers was ongoing, but it was always determined that Vision Witch was going to be 12 issues. And I used two issues to get them started, which left me with 10. And then I thought, I, Richard Howell was the artist on it, and um, Carol Kalish was his girlfriend, and she was also the marketing director, I hope. I'm, I might have the title wrong at this time, but she was a honcho at Marvel. Um, and the three of us went out to dinner, you know, when we started this to kind of talk about what we might want to do. And I had gotten Vision Witch married uh, in the original Avengers right? and thought, well, what's the next step for a married couple? And, of course, it's kids. And, of course, they can't because <laughs> he's an android. Yeah. Of course, she's magic, you know. Yeah. So we were just throwing this stuff around. And, and I thought, yeah, you know, she can make it happen. And that's what a parenting couple would do. And I have 10 issues and I could make it, I could, you know, so I could do the nine month thing. And then the idea was, in addition to her getting bigger every month, every month had a holiday in it. So I could tie each story to a holiday. So the whole thing just became this kind of like, what can I structure around a year long commitment here? So at the end, they had their kids. And pretty soon, John Byrne came along and said, no, that never happened. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they, they wrote the kids out, which I was, you know, that didn't make me happy. No, but, of course. you know, it was, it was his book at that point. Uh, and it gives us an interesting way to progress character arcs in a fast way as well. Like this whole affair that's coming up with Norman and Crystal. Uh, either if this had, if this whole miniseries had taken place in just one month, I think they would have had to say that Crystal was having an affair uh, bef like prior to this series. But because it's spaced out so much, we get to actually see all of it unfold in front of our eyes here. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think it's a cool way to do that. Yeah, I agree. All right. Okay. Uh, issue four. Yep. All right. This one's called Mutant Romance Tales, which is probably a nice little nod to the romance comics of the 50s. Absolutely. That splash page too. Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, so we get uh, Wanda and Vision, you know, they, they find out officially that they are pregnant. Um, and at the same time as they're kind of finding that out, there was a group of bigots that had burned down their first house in Leonia. They're apparently planning on doing it again. Yep. And they end up stopping them uh, with the help of their neighbors, which was uh, a, a super-powered stage magician couple known as Glamour and Illusion, which we talked about earlier. Uh, this is their first appearance, so this is the big money one for JC. Yep, right. <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, what's really cool with this is we get Doctor Strange in the role of an actual doctor uh, cameoing in a, in a few of these issues. He is the one helping Wanda with her pregnancy, and I thought that was kind of cool. It, it's cool, but it's like... He's not an obstetrician. He's a surgeon. True. He shouldn't right. actually. This this is out of his field. <laughs> and I and I think he does mention that too. That that's not uh, his normal thing. But I mean, this because at one point he's prescribing her prenatal stuff, and so this must mean he still has his his doctor's license. ability to do that. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Maybe which is a little weird. That is weird. Uh, let's talk about these bigots because I think that it kind of. Uh, you know, even though this was written quite a while ago, I think it's obviously it's a universal kind of topic, despite the decade that we're in. Yep. Now I know Steve Englehart. You know, he's a he's a self-professed liberal, and I can see what he's going from uh, or go, going with here with uh, this this because it's very stereotypical. You know, it's a bunch of meathead. You know, kind of uh, white guys who are short-sighted and everything else. Yeah. I think what I would have liked, instead of them kind of just getting straight up, just, oh, we're good. First off, going to the extreme of burning down a house seems, <laughs> I mean, that's that seems pretty crazy, uh, personally. Oh, for sure. And then to do it again, or to plan to do it again, 
but you know these guys are basically depicted as bullies. You got your your leader, and then the the guys that are following them. Um, but they're stopped, and I kind of would have preferred to showcase a little bit more of maybe them learning a lesson, or hmm. I, I guess a little less two dimensional because I just think it. I, I I don't know. They show how their fathers. They show how they're good dads. That they're family men. That they're homeowners. That they're and not to say that you can't be a bigot and have those things, but I think I think it would have been nice to see a little bit more exploration of, you know, they're not just a bunch of jerks. Like, I don't know. I just feel like we, we could have seen a little bit more there. Yeah, and maybe, so there, I got a couple comments on that. Maybe it's just the fact that, you know, they didn't learn a lesson because, you know, they did it once before and they're going to do it again. Maybe mm-hmm. there's no no turning around for these guys. Sure. The other thing is that I think that with subjects like this and the the age demographic that these these writers are writing for, which is, you know, the 12-year-old boy type of demographic, uh, you, you're just right. more yeah, yeah. blunt and not as nuanced with this sort of stuff. And that makes sense. Uh, you know, this, this that's exactly it. You know, he, he is writing to his audience a little bit. And, yeah, you have to do a little bit more of the black and white. And I suppose, yeah, if, if you did too much of them showing them not as stereotypical, then the gray area could have become confusing, I, right. I imagine, for younger readers. Yeah, I think that he wants them just to be two-dimensional because that's the point he's trying to get across. Uh, you're right. I didn't even notice that they didn't learn a lesson in the end, but they probably should have. There should have been some repercussions. Yeah, I would have liked that, and I think that that would have almost, I mean, not to make it preachy, but I think it would have made even made it even better for the younger readers so that they can realize that... There are consequences. Okay. Right, exactly. Because, like, yeah. these guys burned down their house. That is a crime. That is yeah. against the law. And <laughs> they apparently got away with it because there's, you know, they're fine. They're, no one's in jail or anything. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, something should have happened there. You're right. And they and they you know they make it a point that this is also a, a very I think they kind of mention how it's an upscale neighborhood and you know obviously we can see these very big houses uh, a house getting burned down that's really gonna you know be noticeable in a in a neighborhood yeah. like this well it'll bring down the property value of the whole neighborhood <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so this page uh, page number one twenty two where all of these guys are standing around the barbecue yeah I do want to make a note of how much I do like Richard Howell's pencils on this one page because we are looking at the same scene from a bunch of different angles. And and he gets the positions of all these characters and everything like he he it's like he's got cameras in a bunch of different spots. There's a tremendous amount yes. of detail in the backgrounds, like he puts enough to show where the camera is at and like this this curved wall that this one guy is leaning up against. It's just yep. I think that there's some great detail. You get to the last issue of this book. And a lot of that detail is gone. Uh, that and that stuff. could be just what you were saying before. How, yeah, it, it, it maybe rushed, maybe uh, leaving it um, more to the imagination because he had other stuff. Yeah, pressing. Um, and the backgrounds filled out it could be more of like maybe Jim Moody, uh, who's the inker on this issue, took um, a little bit more time to to flesh that out. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know what the process was here, but I this page stuck out to me as like, you know, this is actually some nice stuff. Yeah, because otherwise it's just four guys talking. I mean, it yeah. could be it's straightforward. That is pretty pretty dull. But yeah, he has some different angles, a, a little almost like a bird's eye view, and yeah, it it, it is well done. Yeah. Um, and then right next to that, the last panel of the next page, we get yep. Vision in a bathrobe. <laughs> there, so, there's the uh, there's the other costume it, stuff that JC was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which is interesting because I think anyone reading this, especially nowadays, who only knows Vision from the movies, this is very awkward because his whole body is red, meaning that his green part of him is actually a costume. Right. And he took it off. So, but in the in the movies, you know, it's all kind of just part of his, his makeup. You know, form, his, yeah. exactly. Um, so, you know, it, and it is awkward. I'll be honest with you. It's weird seeing him more. <laughs> well, you know, almost nude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also in this panel, uh, Scarlet Witch is holding the idol of Zor. And that, I uh, would talk about Chekhov's gun. Here's something that's not going to come into play for like several issues down the road, but we get a little oh, nice. note of it right here. That's, um, yeah, that's good. Actually, I didn't, I didn't actually catch that. 
that's nice. And that comes from uh, they have a little note here from Power Man and Iron Fist 102. Yep. Which they teamed up with Power Man and Iron Fist in that issue. That's cool. I should check that one out. So yeah, I just wanted to make mention on 127. So Vision oh, wants yeah, to be proactive. It, yes, yeah, he wants to be proactive. He wants to track these guys down or or try to figure out what what's happening because they they can't, they they get wind that you know they, their house might be in jeopardy and, and stuff like that. Um, and they have this whole montage where he's secretly phasing through the entire town and everybody's houses and people's businesses. And uh, it's kind of creepy. It's very creepy. Uh, if I found and, out that that was going on, I wouldn't want this guy living in my neighborhood. Well, and that's what I'm saying. They, they're talking about how they want to be accepted, but you can't just do that. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that would creep out anybody. Yeah. Um, and, I, uh, you know, he's doing it where I don't think he is visible. But even still, um, you know, there's some there's some boundaries you're crossing there, buddy. Definitely. Yeah, I thought the same thing. It's like, that's just not, not cool, Vision. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so in this, we also meet up with a librarian in this issue for the first time who this character is going to come into play uh, throughout the rest of this series. And uh, just a teenage girl who it takes an interest to all of the books that Wanda happens to be checking out of the library because they're all about witchcraft mm -hmm. and such. Did you want to make mention of Glamour and Illusion at all? Did you have any comments about them with their first appearance? Yeah, it's so funny because they are dressed like mu magicians like a magician and a magician's assistant typical like with the fishnet stockings and whatever that kind of thing mm -hmm. right um mm -hmm. and the, like the here's another character that just dress like this all the time uh they're they whether they're at a show or not they're always in their kind of work outfits <laughs> yeah, right it's kind of funny yeah they're, they're interesting characters i like that they are uh, that they have these powers they have weird powers by the way um so Isla Zarkov, who is Illusion, uh, he has the power to rearrange molecules, um, but only like, how does he describe it? If there's, if there, if he has a molecule, he can, if he has like an apple, he can take it and rearrange the molecules of the apple. In one of these issues, he has um, a burned piece of cloth that's been scattered, or a burned book, I mean, that's been, the ashes have been scattered all over the place. So he's able to, once he has a hold of some of the ash, he can then call the the molecules from the rest of that book and reform the book from wherever they've scattered from. So that's kind of a cool uh, power. Mm -hmm. And then Glamour's power, her name is uh, Glynis Zarkov. She has the power to also rearrange molecules, but she can only rearrange her own molecules. So she does that to herself uh, a couple of times in this book. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you make mention. Yeah, they're constantly dressed up also in their stage outfits. And they come across here as their neighbors. They, you know, come across very, uh, you know, we're here to help. We want to help you guys out. And they do. And they become basically Wanda and uh, Vision's kind of like couple friend uh, friends that yeah. they we see them a, a number of times throughout here. And I'll be honest with you, I actually didn't like them until issue nine when we get the revelation of what's going on with them. Why, that, why is that? Um, I just, I, I guess I just found them boring. Because they are so normal. There is really, and right. they, they don't use their powers or flaunt their powers or anything like that. So like when they come over for dinner, there's no family drama or they are just painfully normal people. Yeah, I really don't have any other uh, reasoning of yeah. not finding them interesting. No, until, I can understand you know, that. Yeah. And then, yeah, when you do find out uh, their secret, then it's like, oh, wow, there's like, we've yeah. all been deceived this entire time. <laughs> yep. So that is cool. Uh, okay, so other than that, uh, Vision's, um, Vision's emotions get stronger and stronger throughout the course of this book. And mm -hmm. at the be in these early issues here, he says things like, I'm so happy, and he gives a big smile, and it just looks weird. It does. It's, it's a little he, unnatural. He's still learning this. Well, and he also, it's weird just because he, he's drawn without eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> They're just black areas <laughs> right. of his face. And so once we get to the end of this book, and he's like, he his, his child's born, and he's smiling big. Uh, oh, that's a spoiler alert, I guess. <laughs> um, like he, he, it's it's way more of a natural thing for him. So it's it's interesting to compare his emotions at the beginning of this book to where to how Steve ends up writing him by the end of these twelve issues, because it's a natural progression, and it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, okay, moving on to issue number five. This one's five. called The Others. Call it All Hallows Eve. And that should give you a hint that we are now in October. Mm-hmm. And in this issue, Scarlet Witch is kidnapped again by the, this time by the dead Salem Seven. Uh, they all died before. And now uh, they've come back to life and they've captured her. And she must face the uh, Samhain, who's the spirit of Halloween, I guess. Um, and meanwhile, Vision works with Zarkovs with uh, Glamour and Illusion to try and get her back. This is kind of the conclusion to our three-part story uh, with the Salem Seven and, and Agatha Harkness. Now, what stood out to me here... And it never really, I never really realized this until reading this mini series that Scarlet Witch is an actual witch. Yes. In the early days, when you read her, when she's part of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and and when she first joins up with the Avengers, they, she's called the Scarlet Witch, but she just has these hex powers, like she waves her hands and then something happens, right? But here she's right. actually practicing spells. She's like doing her chants and she has a pentagram on her floor with candles and you know all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff like she's actually a practicing witch and that never occurred to me before reading this series that that's actually part of her character well, and i uh you know i i actually prefer the idea that she's a sorceress because i think it obviously it certainly makes her more powerful yeah you know the her mutant hex especially in those early days was almost pointless because most of the time it wouldn't do what she wanted it to do. Right. Um, which, you know, it was a product of the times. I was a big fan of the Kurt Busiek, George Perez run on Avengers and Scarlet Witch played a, a major role in that, uh, at least in the early issues. And she, she, her costume design was that of a gypsy and she, she used a lot. It was a lot more of that. So I have always kind of preferred her that way because I kind of not grew up that with with that version of her, but it just it, it makes her that much more interesting. I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm curious where they take it in the live action stuff. If uh, you know, we see her going more down that road. If maybe they introduce Agatha Harkness, or maybe Doctor Strange teaches her stuff. Um, I'm curious because I I think it'd be interesting to see more from her as we saw in the comics like this. Yeah, she's a, in the movie, she's a fairly flat character. Mm-hmm. She's just very, very powerful, and that's about it. So, yeah, it would be nice to see some development there. Uh, and that's why she's a witch now is because, like you said, her powers were kind of wacko, and she couldn't really control them. So what better way to learn to control them than to study this stuff and uh, right. and actually learn about it? So that's what she's doing. So this issue, I, I was actually a big fan of this. This was... Um, this was actually an exciting story uh, and, and and actually creepy at times because the Salem Seven are they're corpses in this. They're yeah. reanimated. They're basically zombie versions of themselves, um, and they're in this netherworld dimension where Sam Hain, who's the embodiment of all Hallows, they refer, you know he refers to himself as, but uh, you know he's basically the the spirit of Halloween, and his plan is to be reborn into our plane of existence using the mystic energy in Wanda's baby. So it, it definitely carries some creepy undertones to the whole story. Right. Um, and I, I liked his design as well. Uh, I just thought it was, uh, you know, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of cool. Yeah. I think that it was a, it, it's a great way to, to tie in what has happened in the past issues is all with, because we have, there's this ongoing theme of reanimation throughout this and we're not and not just with reanimating the dead but like scarlet witch animates children inside of her and it's this ongoing theme that gets played up again and again uh all the way to the very last issue of this thing so it, yeah it was interesting to see this there are lots of um cameos in this issue oh yeah just so many yeah, I was going to ask cameos. you uh yeah. if you uh if, if if you know who they all are because there's one, I have a question. I think I know who the rest are. Okay, so there's one on page 151, right beside Dracula, who I wasn't sure about. I think that I think they say he's. Oh yeah, he says, says that Korvac. He's Korvac. Yeah. So that yeah, so that's Corvac from like uh, Michael that classic Korvac? Avengers story. I think so. I guess I didn't recognize. <laughs> I only remember him looking like a normal person. I don't remember. Yeah, the outfit. not in a weird purple suit. But then on 152, is that the the group scene you're talking about here? Yes. I'm curious about the guy, the, the first guy up there, the basically the scientist with, with the glasses. Is Who do you think that's supposed to be? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not too yeah. sure. I'm, 
I'm wondering if it's Egghead. I can't remember if Egghead had died at this point. I know he was responsible for the downfall of Yellow Jacket and, you know, Henry Pym and all that. But I can't remember if he passed and I mean, he just looks like a generic scientist guy, bald guy. Um, you probably we obviously right. we, that's what, that's my guess. But we get Count Nefaria next to him. Yeah. Uh, the original Baron Zemo. And then we get Baron uh, Von Strucker, Crimson Dynamo is behind him, which I also believe is the, supposed to be the original Crimson Dynamo. Um, but And then I think there was one more, but not there. Did we already miss it? There was also, oh yeah, the page right prior. 151, we got Dark Phoenix as well. Right, yes. And then on 153, we have the Wizard and um, Miss yes. America, who were, mm-hmm. they... they originally uh, suspected that the they were the parents of Quicksilver and Wanda before it was revealed that Magneto was. Right, which I, I don't know. I kind of have a soft spot for that. I kind of preferred that over the Magneto one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to bring in uh, the more of a 40s connection to the overall universe. But I think because we see them two, that this whole thing is all kind of illusion in terms of all these various dead Marvel characters. I think it's I don't I don't think we're actually seeing their spirits here. Right, because those two are not dead, right? I don't think so at this point. Yeah, I'm not sure cuz uh when was this? This is the 80s. Yeah, well maybe they were gone. I can't remember what happened in their storyline, but they kind of stopped showing up around the 70s after Shooter was y- using them in the in Avengers. Right. Um we and this this must be the official I'm guessing the official rested piece for Agatha Harkness. She has a really visually stunning showdown with Sam Hain uh, that I thought was was really cool. Um, but then I don't know. She kind of even talks about how you know her time is now done. I don't know if we see her again after this in in the books. Uh, she does come back to life eventually. I don't know how. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm not sure. But let's. Uh... Let's, let's keep, move on. Yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so this is Vision and Scarlet Witch issue six. Uh, this is called No Strings Attached. This is probably one of the best issues in the in the twelve issue yeah. series. Uh, this is the Thanksgiving issue. Uh, Vision and Wanda host Thanksgiving dinner at their house. They have various friends and family as guests, which are a lot of cool little cameos and, and character moments. Uh, much to the surprise of everybody. Uh, Wanda had invited uh, hers and Quicksilver's father, Magneto, uh, which may- instantly makes everything crazy awkward, uh, especially considering Captain America is there and only knows him as a supervillain. Yeah, right. Um, but then uh, a-, a jealous, angry toad from the old Brotherhood of Evil Mutants uh, attacks with synthetic replicas of the original Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Um, And we have this kind of interesting team-up with Vision, Quicksilver, and Magneto uh, kind of put their differences aside and and team up to take down Toad. uh, And and Magneto makes it a point to say, you know, I, I don't want Wanda to know about this. And then he floats away <laughs> that was a great moment i really loved that it was. he because uh, at this point in history like he's i think taking over the new mutants um he's not actually a bad guy really right yes because wasn't wasn't the avengers versus x-men miniseries of this time wasn't that kind of he goes on trial and the Avengers have a big problem with it because they only know him as the mass murderer that he was. Right. And the X-Men are trying to but defend was... him. And yeah, right. Xavier's gone, so he's trying to fill that hole that Xavier left. Uh, and and so he's trying to be a, a good guy here. And I love that moment at the end. It's like, no, Scarlet Witch, Wanda wants me to... What does he say exactly? He says, uh, because she told me I must earn her acceptance... And she will yes. think that I fought this battle to accomplish that. I do not espouse the ideals this man did, but I am still Magneto. I do not grovel nor seek to curry favor, nor must I be perceived as doing so. I have sworn a new vow to gain the world's acceptance. Let my conduct there earn my daughter's respect and my son's. Mm-hmm. And then he flies away. He's like, yeah, that's that's really, really good writing, I think, from Magneto. Through this entire issue... He he he's you can feel the pain. He, he longs to be a part 
of his mm-hmm. kid's family, but because of his past actions, um, he has to right. just stay at arm's length. And, you know, this is obviously very, very relatable. Yes, it's superhero, supervillain stuff, but, I mean, this is no different than an estranged father co- trying to come back into the kid's life. You know, maybe yeah. he was, a, you know, a deadbeat there for a while and was trying to turn himself around. Um, and it, it's no different, you know. You have the one sibling who's trying to give him the opportunity for a second chance, and then you would have, you know, you know, in this case, Quicksilver, who is just, how could you? Don't you remember how he used to be? And this is the very, th- I think this is what Egglehart really excels in the most, are these little nuances, these moments in time with uh, with humanity, with humans, with family and friends. He, he does a, a great job here. Um, yeah. No. So Toad here, uh, this spins yeah. <laughs> out of a story from Avengers where uh, way back when Wanda and Scarlet Witch were on the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, um, they fight a battle with the against the X-Men uh, and the Stranger gets involved and eventually the Stranger takes Magneto and Toad to his, his planet, wherever, in, in deepest outer space. And that's when Wanda and and uh, Pietro are able to escape from his clutches, and then they go in and join the Avengers. But Magneto comes back, and he abandons Toad in outer space. And it's it's something that I think maybe at the, t- at the time editors probably just forgot that Toad was there, <laughs> and Magneto just came right. back, and there was no mention of Toad. But they but Engelhart and um, I can't remember who wrote a story before this when um, when Toad comes back. I think in the pages of Avengers, uh, they've written this whole story of him kind of gaining uh, all of this knowledge of mechanics and and machinery and stuff while he was with the stranger, and now he's back, and he's an actual formidable force now. <laughs> yes, he's call- he calls himself the terrible Toad King. Yep, he is not just Toad anymore. <laughs> And he's after Wanda because he's always loved Wanda, and but she's never given him the time of day because of his appearance or whatever. Right, and we see this in a few issues later um, because there was an issue of Spider-Man where it almost seemed like he was kind of trying to become a hero of sorts, and they kind of, you know, it was a jokey issue kind of because he was teamed up with uh, the amazing Spider-Kid and... Um, frog man or leapfrog whichever it was uh, yeah. which was a pudgy kid uh and they actually make mention of how that fits with this kind of newer villainous take of the toad uh which we'll obviously get to uh when we talk about that the um the thing i want to mention the guest list for the thanksgiving dinner um aside from some of the superheroes so we had quicksilver crystal their daughter luna uh, we had Namor, Captain America, and Wasp from the event, uh, Avengers. Uh, Glamour and Illusion are there in their stage uh, clothes. Yep. Okay. Well, so is everybody else. <laughs> so is everybody else. Doctor Strange is there. Uh, but we do get Norm Webster, who was their realtor. Uh, I'm assuming, I guess, friend as well, because, you know, we didn't invite our realtor to our Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they've actually made a good point throughout the first few issues to show that um, they had started kind of a friendship uh, with with this guy. He sold them their first house, and now he's back. He was one of the people who mm-hmm. stood up for them uh, against the, those bullies and such. So he's welcome around. Um, and then we also get Martha Williams, who we saw in the Avengers West Coast uh, issues where that's Simon and Eric Williams' mother who yep. has – officially she sees vision as her third son and so he she got to be at this thanksgiving dinner so and not in that in that one picture where everybody's got that kind of norman rockwell uh, all around the table picture um the one person who's missing there is holly uh she's actually here as well and holly, oh is that uh wanda's student yeah wanda's student and this is the issue where oh, okay. she agrees to start teaching wanda uh to be a witch got it okay all right yeah, and this is also the first issue where Norman meets Crystal, which has huge ramifications coming up. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because you, you can go back and look at these scenes, and every every so often it seems like the two of them are talking to one another in the background or what have you. Yeah, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's kind of interesting how they kind of subtly put that in there. And they made mention of, or JC made mention of the invaders 
uh, reunion here. Yes, yeah. Because Namor is right now part of the Avengers, and so he's at this party, and Vision is rebuilt from the original Human Torch, and those are the three, them, them with Captain America are the three original invaders from World War Two. As was the continuity of the time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that doesn't stick, so this moment... Kind of doesn't make sense anymore, but <laughs> it was nice while it was nice while it lasted. Yeah. <laughs> um. So Toad gets away at the end of this, doesn't he? Yes. Yes, he does. Okay. He flies away in his spaceship. <laughs> As that makes total sense. All right. Yep. Because in the start of the next issue, we see him right on the cover. Yeah, this issue is called Batteries Not Included, and it begins with another little Invaders reunion. And they go into a little bit of the history of the Invaders, talking about uh, all uh, the relationship with the original Human Torch and such. But in this one, uh, Vision breaks... Not, he doesn't break into the vault, but he goes to the vault because that's where he he has a the mastermind decoy or the the robot that the toad created once it gets some information and it ends up having a big it's, battle it's actually uh project pegasus oh right yeah of course project pegasus i think the vault isn't hasn't been introduced yet at this point right and so yeah actually that's something we're going to talk about when we talk about um west coast avengers uh, epic collection volume two but mm-hmm. uh yeah so yeah there are project pegasus where i guess all of the major supervillains go in and there's a great battle between vision and this robot mastermind who uh, who eventually gets torn apart and his legs just kind of go running around <laughs> and and they use yeah. the, the, the legs um run into this uh, force field beam which disrupts the force field and lets the toad free it's a very comical moment but it's like wow the toad actually thought of uh, he had the foresight to program that behavior into this robot in order so that uh, if he, in the event that he got caught he would be freed and so like that shows some uh, some thinking behind the character which we don't usually get from toad uh right and they, they they do i mean there is a lot of groundwork laid here to to actually make toad somewhat formidable to actually make him uh, a, a major player. I mean, he, he has access to all this alien technology that he actually understands. Yeah. I'm very curious where the character goes after this series is this uh, limited series is done. Um, I know we see him again, I'm sure, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering what happens to him because he didn't become a major player. <laughs> no, he didn't. This is our Christmas issue, although it doesn't really spend a whole lot of time talking about Christmas or like it, Thanksgiving was a way bigger deal in the previous issue than Christmas yeah. in this one. Well, I like the this kind of uh, quest that Vision goes on to try to figure himself out more. You know that he goes to talk to Cap and Namor, and you know he he doesn't feel like the original Human Torch. He only knows that he's made up of the original Human Torch, but he has none of the memories of World War Two, and he's trying to find um, not his humanity, but he's trying to find kind of his place almost as an android on the top of page 199 we get this great scene where he's passed out or you know momentarily deactivated and we see some of the other marvel uh robots of of the time including uh shield lmds yep. uh, the awesome android of the mad thinker we see ultron in the background there and it's it's kind of interesting because he he it's almost like he's identifying with them before he's identifying with humans. Yeah, I can see that, and I love how the the issue is bookended. Like we start with the conversation with the invaders about the original Human Torch, and then we end this issue with the uh, with Vision falling back into the atmosphere and burning up and becoming himself a Human Torch as he contemplates his existence. It's kind of interesting. Very yeah, polite. I actually really, I really like that. I thought yep. that was really interesting. Him propelling himself through the vacuum of space, just using his uh, sun jewel uh, to to propel him. I, I thought that was really uh, interesting visual for sure. Oh, I forgot to mention. Um, back in the last issue, uh, or maybe it was two issues ago now, because um, you, I was going to point out this moment when Vision puts his costume back on. Go back to page number one forty nine. All right. Vision has the rest of his costume on, but not the hood. And then he he flips up the little green part. Oh, yeah. Yep, <laughs> and he's putting on the gloves. Uh, yeah, So that's right. We had mentioned that uh, earlier. I, I was going to bring that up, but I forgot. So we had to jump back a little bit. So, yeah. 
So if if he's not in costume, then he always had to suit up just like everybody else. It just seems weird for a, an android to have to go do that. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and then this this issue ends with a great cliffhanger um, where Holly sees um, sees Norman and Crystal uh, kissing when they shouldn't be, and that's right. that's great. I, I love it, and it's like knowing that this is a month ahead. It's like they're not going to resolve this. Like it's going to stay a secret because, of course, we're going to jump for a month, and uh, either they know about it already when we first open the issue, or they don't know about it, and when we open it up, they don't know about it. Right. So, yeah. So b- between the panels type of thing after after Thanksgiving and then before or, or up to Christmas, the two of them have been uh, canoodling behind everyone's back. Yeah. I liked Crystal again, not as much as I liked the other women, but I mean, I I, <laughs> I liked Crystal and yeah. I did not like. I did not like Quicksilver. I always, Quicksilver was always an asshole. So I thought, well, he's always been completely unbending and, and basically a bigot, a racist, and, you know, whatever you would call it in terms of mutants. And again, you know, I was doing and throwing in, you know, guest stars and holidays and all that stuff. But still, that, you know, that could become sort of a one-note kind of deal. So I uh, wanted to flesh it out and and... You know, it just sort of went that way that I thought this guy's an asshole. She's a nice person, but she's married to an asshole. Yeah. And so it just became part of, you know, there was an element of soap opera, obviously, in this thing, too. If you're, you know, if you're going to write about a pregnancy, you're probably, you know, moving more towards soap opera than you are intergalactic space combat. So all that stuff just kind of fit together. And that was I did it, and nobody really, I mean, and nobody said, don't do it. But afterwards, people said, don't really pursue it. And I did sort of pursue it, and that led to some some headbanging on down the line. And, you know, at the end of the West Coast Avengers, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of, there was a lot of headbanging at the yeah. end of the West Coast Avengers. And, and, and part of it was over, yeah, you know, I was still doing Quicksilver as an asshole, and, and, that wasn't the main reason, but that was part of it, yeah. All right. Vision and the Scarlet Witch, issue eight. This one is called Sweet Sister, <laughs> which is a little bit of a play on our guest uh, star hero here with Luke Cage, Power Man. Um, the High Priest of Zor uh, and his demons <laughs> yeah. arrive on Earth t- to exact revenge on Vision, Wanda, and Luke Cage. Uh, and this is basically a direct sequel to that Power Man and Iron Fist issue. Um, uh, and basically he wants to get back that idol of Zor that we saw earlier that she was unpacking. Uh, Quicksilver, Quicksilver is also in this issue, helps out the, the heroes. And uh, at the same time, Crystal is destroying the idols. I guess there's more than one idol. And uh, this one's probably the most superhero-y feeling issue, at least that we've had in a while with the series. Well, I mean, the the fight with um, Magneto versus the the old the robot brotherhood of evil mutants was pretty super that's true yep throughout this issue uh quicksilver is here and i found that every time quicksilver is in an issue that we have to talk about his militia that he's starting he's kind of in in charge of the inhuman army and th- this is obviously to sh- to like they keep saying it over and over again he's just not around he doesn't have time for his family because he's always doing stuff with his militia uh, obviously, this is playing up to to lead into reasons why Crystal is doing what she's doing. Um, but at the time, when, right. if you don't know that, it's like, man, they just keep on going about this stupid militia. Uh, yeah, he does talk about it a lot. And, and quite frankly, anybody who's read Marvel up to this point, anything with Quicksilver, he's usually come across as a jerk. Yeah. I, I mean, it, I kind of – it's. It's kind of odd that he even your crystal even married him to begin with, in my personal opinion. But <laughs> right, uh, you know, she she saw something uh, at at some point there. And what was interesting with this issue was on page two fourteen, Luke Cage talks about how this is uh, this takes place on Martin Luther King's birthday. And I actually checked this, uh, researched this, and Martin Luther King Jr. Day 
was actually first observed on January 20th, 1986. Oh, this is so brand that, new. Yeah, so that must have been the exact date that this story takes place. So they always talk about the sliding Marvel timeline. Well, you always get these anchor points, unfortunately. I mean, this is <laughs> yeah. absolutely, this is 1986 uh, to the day, January 20th. Right, um, because um, uh, Scarlet Witch even says, oh, of course, the new holiday. <laughs> yep. And that's that's what sparked uh, piqued my interest because all of a sudden I'm like, well, as far as I've ever known, that was a holiday. So I was like, all right, let me let me look that up. And yeah, sure, sure enough. So uh, yeah, uh, Englehart made it a point to put that in here. And you know, what better character than than Luke to you know uh, kind of showcase that in the story? I, I think it was really uh, well done. I, I liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and here I think this issue really puts on display Quicksilver's hot temper. He doesn't want to be pushed around. He doesn't want any help. He refuses He refuses to accept help from everybody. And so when uh, Quicksilver, or so when Luke Cage tries to help Quicksilver out by holding onto him so he doesn't blow off the roof of the World Trade Center, he mm-hmm. really takes offense to that. And uh, and then meanwhile, we get this parallel story of uh, what's happening with uh, with Crystal and Norman in the background as well so there's there's a lot of stuff going at play and i really like how Engelhart has um purposely um you know laid out this whole character arc for these two characters over the 12 issues and he's taking his time with it he, he's building it up little by little he's not rushing into this at all i like it a lot mm-hmm. um and i i really like the way that this ends because it you you have your uh, Quicksilver, of course, being the hothead, kind of flipping out on Luke, and uh, Luke kind of kind of taking the higher road a little bit, but he 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 talks a little bit about Martin Luther King Day. I, I like the the last couple panels there where he says he goes, um, you know, uh, to me what it really means is blacks finally got certified as part of this society, and the way we all just fell into working together today says that too. King Day don't say we're different from white folks. It says we're equal. We ain't better, and brother, we sure ain't no worse. And it cuts to Quicksilver, you know, <laughs> yeah. probably arguing with uh, Wanda there. But I, I just love that that thing there. Uh, and, and again, you know, uh, the, these things are kind of timeless. You know, it's this is 1986. We're in 2020 uh, with this recording, and I, I think those are words that we should be living by. Totally, absolutely. Uh, I only have one final thing that I want to mention before we can move on. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the coolest moments I thought in this whole issue was on page 225 when they need to get to the top of the World Trade Center really fast. And it's going to take forever. The power's out. They're going to take, it's going to take forever to take the stairs. So Vision goes to the, flies to the top really quickly, grabs onto the elevator cable, and then turns himself into an extremely dense weight so that he can... Um, fall down the elevator shaft holding onto this elevator cable, pulling the elevator car all the way to the top at, like, really, really fast speed. I thought that was a very um, very creative way to use his powers. Uh, I agree. Uh, uh, the occupants of the elevator had to have been, their ears had to have been popping like crazy. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Definitely. Uh, to go that fast. But, yes, that was, that was really cool. I always like when they put in comics – a different, unique way of using a power. Yep. I've always enjoyed that. Okay, we can move on to issue number nine. This one's called Offline, and we are now in, um, are we now in March? Or is this April? I can't remember. Well, we're we're going into, uh, I believe we're going into, is this the Mardi Gras issue? Or are we not there yet? Oh, yeah, no, this is Mardi Gras. Okay, yep. This is spring break, around spring break. So this is uh, definitely March. And we are, uh, yeah, they're taking a little trip to just m- whatever little corner of town uh, has the Mardi Gras festival. They actually went to, they went to New Orleans, actually. Oh, all the way to New Orleans? I, I missed that. Yeah. I didn't yeah, catch that. Yeah, because Wanda says something about how she's not supposed to be traveling, but she traveled anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, they're in New Orleans, and they I, they are in their full superhero outfits. And again, they say, oh, finally, a place where we can feel uh, at ease in our outfits or whatever. It's like you know, you could just take off your costumes and <laughs> it would be fine. Oh yep. yeah, that's right. The reason they've gone here is because. Um, Glamour and Illusion have a, an annual show that they put on in New Orleans, and so they're going to watch the show. And this is where we find out that they yes. are part of... Um, they, they're ju- jewel thieves. They go to different places in order to um, 
steal some stuff from safes while uh, they're putting on their act. So um, this is, I think, where we see them use their powers the most. We haven't yes. really seen them put their powers into action except for that one scene where they're putting the book back together. And uh, yeah, we get to see them actually do their thing and they're actually quite good at it. At, at being jewel thieves they know they know what to do and then there's this other subplot where the enchantress comes to just like seduce vision into stealing the same thing that gl- that glamour is going to steal I, I found that completely out of left field i didn't understand why she was there why she was doing what she was doing and <laughs> it was just like a very out of place issue almost like uh Engelhart had 11 issues of story and just needed something for the 12th issue and stuck this in here because it felt very out of place. Yeah, I think uh, I think I think he knew he wanted to do something with the reveal for Glamour and Illusion. And I think, OK, yep. let's take him to Mardi Gras. Um, I, I'm wondering if he just you know, went to the Marvel offices and asked, OK, what villain is not doing anything uh, this month? You know what I mean? And, and oh, well, you can take it in Chantress. Oh, OK, I'll figure something out. The other thing, the other possible thing is that he had no, like, he didn't want to put Enchantress or any supervillain in here, but the editor's like, buddy, come on, you got to put a, a supervillain in here. We, like, what's the cover going to look like? A magic show? <laughs> right. Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, we got, a, we got a, a heck of an alluring cover to this issue. Uh, yep. That's very well done there, um, living up to the Enchantress's uh, uh, abilities. So what did you think of the um, reveal of Glamour and Illusion? Because um, I was I was surprised. Even though I read these once upon a time, I completely forgot about the, these two characters. I was surprised too. It came out of left field. We I it was uh, a total shock. And like I said at the beginning, it's like wow they they've been hiding this from us the entire time. We had no mm-hmm. hints of this. Yep. And uh, and it changes the way we view the characters. Yes. It does, and like I said, now all of a sudden I was like, oh, these guys are interesting because they make it a point to tell them, oh, yeah, we have these powers, but we don't use them to fight crime. I hope you don't think less of us for doing so. And then it's like, well, because you're using them for the other thing. Yeah, right, exactly. (laughs) And it makes us realize now that the only reason why they're friends with Vision and Scarlet Witch is to give them credibility. Uh, and mm-hmm. they wanted them in the front row of their their things so that they could be eyewitnesses to their alibi. Mm-hmm. And it's like, wow, they, they're actually very conniving people. Yes. Um, page 242, we see Glamour using her abilities. And I got to say, it's incredibly creepy. <laughs> yeah. It just turns into this weird drip ooze creeping across the floor with her face uh, and hair still on yeah. it <laughs> yeah it's it's very off-putting i also actually wanted to make mention of the splash page on 231 remember how i told you richard howell was working on hawkman at dc at the same time as this yeah uh look above oh um, yeah look at Glamour. that that's uh you know a subtle uh hawkman it, i mean it it's really well is <laughs> he's got the boots with the white or the yellow stripe the red underpants uh yeah yep. it is hawkman for sure so there's a little dc crossover don't tell dc that's funny i love it oh boy <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, other than this, it it posed some good character moments for Vision, who kind of reaffirmed his love for Scarlet for Scarlet Witch because uh, you know he he'd been infatuated with Enchantress because he was under a spell, and this is I think a lot of this scene is here to show the contrast between their marriage and Crystal and Quicksilver's, because while he he had fully admitted. You know, absolutely, when I was under her spell, I totally enjoyed it because I'm human. Like, yeah. Um, But if I didn't, if I wasn't under the spell, I wouldn't have made a move uh, because I'm devoted to you. And so this is, uh, and this is in direct contrast to exactly what Crystal is doing uh, with Norman. Right, which, uh, yeah, we have that exchange with Vision and Wanda on 250 and 251. And I think it's done really well. I think. Uh, how you had mentioned about the grill uh, scene with the um, the neighborhood uh, bullies, yep. how th- it was very unique and different. This is the same sort of thing. It's, you know, uh, a nice back and forth and different camera angles and uh, actually some really nice shots of, uh, like, Wanda's face on 251 there. Um, I mean, it almost looks like that had to have been a reference to a photo or something. It looks really well done. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the missing is some backgrounds in some yep. of these panels here, which uh, is that's in contrast to the other page that I mentioned. So we're getting to the end of the series and we're seeing more of that where if there's a couple of people in the scene, uh, Howell's not putting backgrounds in. Mm -hmm. And then the final page is uh, Crystal and Norman Webster doing, uh, you know, their, their stuff. And she's not feeling all that great. And she completely blacks out. Great cliffhanger. Yes. And I guess we should mention that uh, Crystal has to take this anti-pollution potion in order to breathe our air and be on Earth. That's the whole reason why Adelon is up on the moon. Uh, it was established in, uh, I think that was John Byrne's run of Fantastic Four. Yeah. So she she takes a swig of that, but it's not enough. And, and she just blacks right out and cliffhanger. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's keep on going over to issue number 10. Spring Fever. Uh, this issue, I think, is the climax of the whole series. Even though the you know the birth of the baby should be the climax, I was way more interested in what was going on with Quicksilver and Crystal here. And yes, for, so for me, this is great. Uh, this is a, a this is my favorite issue of the whole book. Oh, more more than the Thanksgiving issue, huh? I think so, um, because <laughs> while I really liked that issue for its character building, I loved how I loved the portrayal of Quicksilver in this one. I really mm -hmm. thought it was excellent. Right off the bat here, uh, it's called Spring Fever. In the credits, it says, with creative input from Anne Nocenti, author of the mm. forthcoming Inhumans graphic novel or graphic album. That one's called uh, By Right of Birth. And, and that didn't come out for like three years after this. So that got held up in the work somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And in that one, Black Bolt and Medusa have a baby. And so there's a little bit of a parallel there. Uh, and by that point, all of this drama with Quicksilver and Crystal um, has been fixed or it's over. So I, I don't know exactly what the creative input is here. And I don't know how much, like, is Anne Nascenti kind of the expert on Inhumans? I'm not sure. I don't I don't know. But right. so that was interesting. But anyway, so Crystal has been in a coma for a month now because mm -hmm. a month has passed and they don't know what to do and Quicksilver is getting more and more agitated and finally uh he finds out the truth because Crystal whispers something in in her sleep and he just goes bonkers. He he just goes right after um Norman who's t who's visiting uh, visiting the moon to check up on on things as well, and there are just a bunch of really good conversations. There's one between him and and Vision, and there's one between uh, him and Wanda. And through this, uh, Quicksilver just gets angry and angrier, and eventually just leaves. He quits his militia. He he leaves his family. He leaves the Inhumans. He just doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody anymore. Um, there was a little bit of poor storytelling, I thought, once uh, Crystal, once there was a point where Scarlet Witch goes into the mind of Crystal, and then we're talking in like little flashbacks here. And then at the same time, Vision is talking to, to, to Quicksilver, and they have flashbacks. And at, at one point in uh, on page 272 and 273, like we don't know which flashbacks are which, they really switch between them very... Uh, in a very cavalier way, and it made for a little bit of an uneasy reading. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you figure it out after a while, uh, so that was okay. But but I just really liked that thing here, and, and he just takes off in the end because he's so upset about what's going on that it was happening for so long that he didn't have any idea. Because um, he And he's so pompous, and he thinks that he's a good husband and he's doing all the right things, but obviously he's yeah. not... He was uh, completely. I mean, this this was embarrassing and insulting to him. You know how dare how dare she cheat on me? Type of deal. Uh, rather than maybe seeing what caused this to happen on his end, obviously he loses it. So he must not have been completely uh, with it to begin with. But yeah. you know, they they try to reach a reconciliation, or it's it's uh, assumed that they will, and it doesn't happen. He won't take her back, and I think he's just completely like embarrassed and, and upset that, you know, how, how could you possibly do this to me without, without looking at, at himself at all as, as what did I do that maybe pushed her that in that direction. And that's just because of how he is. He's very, you know, egotistical uh, and, and just can't see past that. And, you know, obviously this is all pretty fresh. It's not like, I mean, this is more of a realistic reaction of uh, in, in sorts. I mean, he still abandons his child, 
which that's the part that isn't really forgivable for his character. Yeah, and it's hard though because at while while Quicksilver yes was not being an attentive husband, um he did not deserve to be cheated on. Like Crystal didn't try talking to him about it or try to make things work or or anything. Right. She just kind of went behind his back and and did his own thing. So I think he is True. justified in some of his actions of being angry and taking off in a sense, but um, both parties are at fault here. It's not a clean situation. Sure. Yeah. Well, they, they do show how he's, you know, kind of constantly feeling like an outcast too. You know, he lives up there with the Inhumans. He knows he's not one of them. You know, he married into the royal family, fathered a child that's part of the royal family, and yet he still has these feelings that he doesn't belong, he doesn't fit. And I feel like it. it, it there just needed to be a little bit more of a push and he probably would have had a similar reaction as this. This is obviously quite a push, yeah. but it, 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 they make mention how, you know, why do you keep working on that stupid militia? What, what are we going to do with it? We, you know, we're not going to go fight anybody. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think he's he, he did it because he's like, oh, only I can do this. And, yeah, he, he just always felt like he, you know, they were always sense of purpose, better yeah. than him. Yeah, I liked a lot this inhuman that we meet in this called, I believe his name is Quidador. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's like kind of a doctor. He's got a really cool design where he's got kind of a fish fin for a beard. Uh, I thought this character was awesome. I, I thought he had some cool dialogue moments. Um, this is his first and only appearance. Oh, too we bad. Never, we never see him again. I'm like, well, of course. I just, you know, I liked this character. <laughs> we, have, we had a cool moment with him and uh, Scarlet Witch. And yep, that's it. <laughs> no more Quidador. Well, that's a shame. Maybe someone yeah. <laughs> will bring him back sometime. The other thing that I really liked in this was on page 264 um, with uh, Norman and Scarlet Witch. Yeah. Norman and Wanda have, have a discussion. She confronts him, you know, how could you do this? And, and he, you know, ha it's, it's a great back and forth. Again, it, it makes a lot of sense. And But he gets that final barb in there where, because she's defending her brother. She's defending Pietro, you know, that you should have honored their marriage, this, that, and the other. And uh, he says, I'm not making excuses for deceiving you, but you like your brother better than a lot of people do. Yeah. And she kicks him out, and then she sits there kind of crying because I think she she does get it. She realizes he's a tough guy to like because he, he doesn't make himself very likable. Yeah. Uh, I love that scene. I think that's incredibly, uh, I don't know, just, just a, a very relatable scene. I think that's really well done. Absolutely. Yeah. All of these conversations in this, this issue are very, very good. And that's mm -hmm. what I love about this issue is this, all of the character moments that happen throughout. And there's, you know, there is a fight between Inhumans and Quicksilver and such, but it's not the focus of the issue. Um, right. And, and when it all comes down to it, it's all about these character development moments that are just wonderful. Yeah, it is a solid issue. I definitely like this one a lot as well. But let's keep on going. Okay, so we got Vision and Scarlet Witch, issue 11, A Taxing Time. We have Peter Parker, who, if you don't know who Peter Parker is, he's a photographer for Now Magazine. He is sent to do a photo shoot of Vision and Wanda at their home. Uh, when he's done, we get the return of the terrible Toad King, uh, this time to destroy the Vision and take Wanda. He has this really cool exoskeleton with all sorts of cool powers and stuff in it. Uh, and we get kind of a, a good old-fashioned Marvel team-up with Vision and Spider-Man um, to, to take him on. And this is the issue that talks about the very different toad that Spider-Man was, was helping out in a, uh, earlier issue of his series. And we, um, and we kind of get, you know, well, what the heck happened here? What, how did you were kind of like a lovable loser in that? And now all of a sudden you're going full super villain. Yeah. I like that moment when they, and they're, what does Spidey say? Uh, I think we need to compare notes because <laughs> they yes. both have a very different view of who yes. this character is. Yeah, I, I love that. Two two superheroes comparing notes. I always like that kind of thing. But it, they they basically show how Toad almost became kind of like I don't know weirdly clingy to Spider Man. Uh, it reminds me of I don't know if you're a Simpsons fan, but the the episode where Lisa gives Ralph the Valentine's Day card. Oh, I choo choose you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and he completely takes it the wrong way. I feel like that's kind of what happened here. Yeah. Uh, Toad went full Ralph Wiggum. <laughs> that's funny. 
Definitely, yeah. Um, there, you made a mention to the All Wiener Squad, mm-hmm. uh, which is Frogman, Spider Kid, and the Toad, the Toad King. That story is told in the Ghost of the Past Spider-Man Epic Collection. So if you want to read more about that, uh, that those are collected, and it's quite quite a good story. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the end here, I love Holly in this issue because she is here with Scarlet Witch. They're practicing their witchcraft or whatever, and and Toad breaks in, and she feels, even though she has no superpowers, she's just a teenage girl, she feels... Uh, compelled to protect Wanda. And she mm-hmm. actually goes and tries to like beat him with a baseball bat or something and it doesn't work. I'm like, wow, that is some pretty tough stuff there. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, I agreed with that. Um, page 285, we get uh, we get some great like inner monologue of uh, Peter. And on panel two, uh, I, I like how he's, He's talking, he goes, I've got to admit, though, it's always weird pretending not to know people I've staked my life on in big, hairy battles. Yeah, right. Uh, because cause he's there as Peter Parker, not as Spider-Man. And at this point, he, he's teamed up with Vision and Scarlet Witch, I, I got to assume, you know, a good dozen times. And he's got to kind of keep up that appearance that he's just, you know, the photographer. Uh, it's got to be kind of interesting because, you know, Peter Parker has teamed up with probably every single person in the Marvel Universe uh, more than once. I like that he uh, is flown around to just take pictures like this of, of Vision and Scar- of Scarlet Witch's mm-hmm. house. It's like, I'm just yes. here to take a picture of your house. Yeah, yeah it's almost like, uh, yeah, like a little little editorial. You know, you can see that being uh, like on Better Homes and Gardens and, you know. Right, like, yeah. Which is why he's the there. superheroes live. He's there with Now Magazine rather than with the Bugle. Yeah. <laughs> this is the the conclusion to the Toad story here because he, once he sees Wanda and sees how pregnant she is, yes. he is repulsed by her, and I think that's kind of uh, so shallow for him. Yeah, I think that's where you lose any sympathy for yeah. him at all. Absolutely, uh, because you had sympathy for him, especially with his run-ins with Spider-Man, where he was trying to be better, and then his his reaction to her just simply being pregnant. Yeah, that even I grimaced. I'm like, yeah. really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that just shows that. And first of all, he's trying to fight for for her like she's a, a prize or something like that. And um, right. like it's her, he is her property. And then like he's just disgusted at her looks because mm-hmm. she's pregnant. And it's like, yeah, there you go, Toad. You are that's that's that wraps up your character kind of in a nutshell here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, good riddance. Yep. <laughs> huh. Okay, on to our last issue here. Vision and Scarlet Witch number 12. This is a double-sized issue, and it's called Double-Sized Climax. And this one is, again, um, the same team of uh, Richard Howell and Frank Springer, who we've been uh, dealing with in the past few issues here. And uh, even just before we get into the story, I just want to note on page 301, mm-hmm. where we have, this is just after the splash page, but we have all of these people just sitting on the lawn talking. It's the exact same setup as the barbecue scene that we talked about earlier with all those bullies. Oh, okay. But it's just not interesting to look at. Yeah, that's a that's a good observation. Yeah, you don't get the interesting camera angles. You don't get the backgrounds. And in fact, that last panel there, it looks like the colorist is trying to make up for the fact that there is no pa- uh, there's no background because half of the blank background is blue and half of the blank background <laughs> is green. Yeah. So there's just uh, you can tell that I think, especially because it's a double size issue, he probably was rushing to get through this, and a lot of this issue has very sparse backgrounds or like just enough information to let you know what's going on um there are some cool splash pages and such but overall it's not as impressive as kind of the start of the of the limited series for sure Mm -hmm. but anyway so this issue here is uh there's two stories going on here one is that uh um the baby's coming early she starts to get her contractions so she's taken to the hospital which is called uh, what is it called englewood hospital which is definitely a reference to steve englehart Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then she gives birth to one child, and then uh, something happens, and she realizes that there's another baby coming out. So she has twins. Now, they've been actually hinting at stuff like this throughout this entire series. They dropped clues or did a little foreshadowing here and there that I guess I forgot to mention. But at one point, she says, 
I, I just I just feel so big and everybody says, man, you know, jokes, you got twins in there. Like she just makes that kind of a comment. Mm-hmm. And um, there is another point in one of these issues where Scarlet Witch has a, a dream where she has her baby. The baby like speaks to her and she realizes it's, it's a son. And then she says, and there is another presence there. So there have been there's been foreshadowing like this kind of all throughout the series that we're going to have twins. And so we finally get to find out here. Including the title of this, uh, they called this double sized climax. Right. So, yeah, it's kind of even teasing it right there. If you haven't picked up on it yet, which it was subtly played out. You know, we 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 really don't know what's going to happen until you get to the point where, you know, yeah, she gives birth and then, oh, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. Yeah. And Dr. Strange makes it a point to even say, he's like, I had no idea. And he like apologizes, right. uh, which is kind of also sort of creepy because you know he's he's also a sorcerer and he didn't pick up on that yeah yeah like what is going on with these kids that he had no idea Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's a secondary plot line here because simon williams comes to visit uh just to say hi and uh and gets mixed up in this whole side plot where necra revives the grim reaper and they try again to uh to to destroy Wonder Man and Vision, the abominations that used to be Grim Reaper's brother. Mm-hmm. Who had, this This confirms, he did die at the end of issue two. Yeah. Uh, which, of uh, West, Co- uh, West Coast Avengers, which, you know, it was left ambiguous, but no, he actually, he was impaled on a stalagmite. <laughs> yes. And um, so, yeah, well, he's then- revived. And the thing that is very interesting, you mentioned in the last episode how you really like Necra's powers, how she uses mm-hmm. her hate, and the more hateful she gets, the stronger her powers are. And at the very end, that ends up being her undoing because the thing that's keeping um, Grim Reaper alive is her powers. And then, but then she doesn't hate Grim Reaper. So the power leaves her, and then he dies. Or dies again right and that plays into his character going forward uh as an actual almost like a, a zombie supervillain. because yeah i mean that they did they didn't retcon that to say oh no he he he's alive he just keeps getting reanimated uh in his later appearances so this was actually the issue that it, it showed that he was brought back to life after being dead and yeah. it, it makes his name that much more you know, because Grim Reaper, you know, deals with death. Well, he's actually a dead guy. Yeah, yeah, very cool. In this issue, Necra also says that um, she was she's been hiding out in these tunnels uh, on page three hundred five. Yes. Mm-hmm. She says, uh, that in the time that they abandoned their search for the Grim Reaper's body, I bore you away with me into the tunnels. The tunnels are running everywhere beneath the earth and ruled by the mysterious Mole Man. And this I wanted to, to note because Engelhart goes into a huge, huge story in his run on Fantastic Four where it's all start like he goes into the underground tunnels that are run by the Mole Man. And that eventually leads to Secret Wars 3 with a huge uh-huh. tale about the Beyonder. And that story is in the um, uh, When Things Change epic collection, the Fantastic Four epic collection. And I actually am going to be doing an episode on that. Uh, next week nice yes i uh i i read that uh full run and yeah i i liked it a lot and he he had some some great artwork on that series as well yep uh on page one uh 313 on page 313 we get a little fight with dr strange and this character called colobron yeah colobron yeah i had to look him up because i'm like it's weird that we're just getting kind of the middle of this fight here but apparently this is his first and only appearance so it's it's, it's, not a reference to anything in the past or anything else that's happening in dr strange's life it's another one and done character that of course i was like oh this guy's cool and i never get to see him again yeah (laughs) yeah he is forever lost in the dimension of no return uh, within its loops of in- infinity. <laughs> a lot of Steve Ditko yeah. there. Yep. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I, like I said, it's a, another interesting visual, you know, basically a cat dude with, you know, dog the bounty hunter hair and a big mustache. Yep. It, it, it's, of course, goofy, but I don't know. Uh, I guess they had to introduce him somehow. What better way to have him fight some demon? It's always fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. The... Uh, what the, so the twins um the the names of the twins are they go with Thomas and William 
And Thomas, I believe, was a reference to the creator of the original Human Torch. Right. And then William is they wanted to honor the Williams uh, kind of name without giving them last names. So that's where they get it, William from. And I, I thought that was both very nice how they came up, came up with that. And I love the moment that Magneto has because he's here in this issue too because of the birth. And he says they've named both of the children after Vision side of the family and none after my side of the family. Like that's got to hurt. He's like, but yeah, I did it to myself. I was a bad guy. And right. At, at least no he legacy. has the, that self-awareness of that. You yep. know, I mean, uh, you know, because he, he, let's face it, he's kind of failed with Quicksilver to begin with, his own son. And, you know, then his grandson's like, well, are, are you going to be part of their lives or or what? Yeah. Um, what did you think? And I'm sure when we get to the second volume of West Coast Avengers, when we talk about that, but what did you think of Simon's new superhero costume? Oh, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's off. Isn't it awful? <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> Um, Wonder Man has a history of really, really terrible costumes, like over and over. The best one yep. is that blue, kind of the dark blue and uh, the one with the red W on the chest that uh, he gets in the, I mean, in the 90s. At least that was a little more subtle. This is green and red. He took his goggles off or his sunglasses. So now he's just, I don't know. It's just a yeah. terrible design. Well, the green and red uh, comes from his original costume, and he gets another right. one in the '70s as well. And like that, those are kind of his colors for a long time, but they don't work. It, all of the designs of his costumes have been just terrible. <laughs> well, I wonder if they really kept playing more with the red, green, and yellow because Vision is red, green, and yellow, and they talk about oh. how they're they talk about how they're twins. So I wonder if at this time when Engelhart was in charge, he really wanted to kind of you know strike strike that right to you. That's possible yeah interesting i hadn't thought about that but you're right it's the same color scheme um okay and the other the last thing here that i want to mention is that we have a kind of a closing moment with uh crystal and norman on page 318 and in here they meet up kind of for the last time and what does crystal say i came to tell you that my husband pietro is still missing our marriage seems to be shattered beyond repair. If he doesn't return to me and my daughter shortly, my family, the royal family of, of Atalan, will grant me a divorce. Uh, that is later revealed to be uh, the case that they don't grant her a divorce at all. Um, it's they, they say that a uh, royal family can't divorce. And so she has to uh, carry on being married mm -hmm. to a guy who is kind of gone off off the rails. And Norman says, uh, and she says that, you know, we can get together again after the divorce. There's a great scene in the Fantastic Four epic collection where she meets up with Norman again after some time. And Norman just says, you know what? I've given this some thought and this is just not going to work out. I've screwed things up too much. We need to just stay apart. And so she's left with nothing. She has no husband, and she also doesn't have Norman either. Yeah, I'll have to read that again because I, I probably read it, and I was like, I don't know who Norman is. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but now I'm curious about seeing that little It is up. interesting because Eng Engelhart takes over Fantastic Four and puts Crystal on the team. And so her story uh, is carried forward, and eventually uh, the, the story of her and Quicksilver getting back together is told in a Fantastic Four annual at the end of the When Things Change uh, volume. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it doesn't end on a great note. So it, yeah. it's just poor Crystal and poor Christ uh, Quicksilver just uh, get put through the ringer because of Engelhart. <laughs> yeah. One one quick thing I also wanted to mention was, uh, and and this is what JC was saying with his comment that uh, this is glamour and illusion are there for them bringing the babies home. They kind of have a little uh, homecoming type of uh, get together, and it's never revealed to anybody. You know, they never they never told Vision and Win Wanda. They never found out that they're actually criminals. And I'm not. Sh I'm sure they turn up again somewhere. So their only other appearance is in a 2004 miniseries called Witches, where both of those characters meet oh, an unfortunate okay. demise. Oh, <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, not only uh, are do they n not appear, but the next time they appear, they're gone, and then we haven't seen them since. So, uh, yep those characters didn't really make a good uh, impression on anybody. 
what I am curious about is, you know, and it's giving nothing away with this episode, you know, I'm curious what, if if any, Steve Englehart had plans for Vision and Wanda's kids. If there was a longer reaching plan, the concept of how they had no idea about the second one. I wonder if he was going to build up on that a little bit and, and explain a little bit more why nobody could detect that there was a second baby. Yeah, I don't know. I should have asked him that when I talked to him. I forgot that I... Uh, there, I should have asked him about Glamour and Illusion as well. Maybe I'll send him an email and just see if he has some answers there. But that is would be interesting to know because he kind of, uh, you know, abruptly ended his time on, on all of his titles at Marvel because uh-huh. of editorial stuff and, and left, never got to conclude a lot of his stories. Right. I know that he, you know, he from what I've read, he doesn't work too far ahead. Like he kind of sets himself up for a few issues in advance and I'm just curious. I mean, this is a not only a big monumental moment in Vision and Wanda's history, but uh, you know that I'm just curious what he had in store if they were going to stay babies, if they were gonna because if they were created out of this witch fire, if they were created out of mystical properties, you know what 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 might have happened with them? I'm curious. Yeah. So, what did you think of this whole mini series? From start to finish. Um, I really liked it. I thought it was clever to give it those uh, monthly time jumps. I think there's a lot of wrapping up of various loose ends from other parts of the Marvel Universe that, again, uh, Steve does very well. Um, I think that he progressed Vision and Scarlet Witch in a natural way. Uh, none of it, None of it felt forced. Yeah, there was some fill-in maybe here and there, but um, a lot of it... I thought that it flowed pretty well. Um, I think anything more than 12 issues might have become a little monotonous, but uh, I think that it was successful in what he was trying to do. I think so, too. I am a fan of, of Englehart's writing. I have quite enjoyed, I, I think, everything that I've read of of his, and this is no exception. I think that he, what uh-huh. he excels at is really getting the nuances of characters and getting those moments that really show who they are and how they interact with other people. And so that one Mm -hmm. issue, when we get multiple conversations with the same people, like one with uh, Norman and Wanda and one with Norman and Vision and one with Scarlet Witch and Vision, and like it just goes on and on. And he, he lays that out so well and he knows the voices of each of these characters so well. And so throughout this one, it's just like, yeah, uh, issue after issue of really great character development. Uh, agreed. Um, I guess we should also mention that this particular volume does have bonus material, just like an epic collection traditionally does. Right. Uh, with some original artwork, and uh, you know, we got a, a great Fred Hembeck comic, which are always fun. Yep. Um, I'm curious if the new printing that's kind of including other Vision and Scarlet Witch material, if they plan on giving that bonus material as well. I, I would imagine they would. They usually do. Uh, there's also a Marvel Age article, an interview with Steve Englehart. This is the same interview that is published in uh, the other in the West Coast Avengers Epic Collection and mm-hmm. is printed at full page rather than four two page, so you can actually read the words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what's funny is we didn't make mention of this. That Marvel Age cover it shows the new team with Tony Stark in that kind of pseudo prototype armor that he fought not Godzilla in. Oh yeah, that's right. They didn't put him in the in the Scarlet Centurion armor there or Silver Centurion. What what is it? I can't the, remember. Sil- the Silver Centurion, yeah. Yeah, Silver. <laughs> so this must have been uh, before that uh, that was all finalized. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Cuz that was one like we talked about, you know, wasn't even part of this collection, but I'm glad we discussed it. Yep, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, okay, so and then we have one page from Marvel Age Annual number 1 which is kind of a joke page of, of uh, all of these different people, family members, getting the call that uh, that <laughs> Vision and Scarlet Witch are going to have a baby. It's not in continuity because it directly uh, counters uh, a lot of the, the stuff that happens in these issues, but it's a fun page. I hope that Simon's Thor collectible phone is continuity, though. I hope that's <laughs> yeah, canon. That's right. <laughs> they got to bring that back. Totally. <laughs> um, okay, so let's wrap up this 
this uh, episode. Thanks, Josh, for being part of this uh, this bonus episode, essentially, um, talking about this West Coast Avengers. I had a lot of fun. Absolutely. I did, too. I, uh, thanks for having me, and uh, I think we'll be talking about Vision and Scarlet Witch soon enough uh, with uh, the main series. And the next time you'll be on the show, we'll actually do a Dracula episode around uh, Halloween, so keep, a, keep an ear open for that one. Yes, great. That sounds good. Yep. But thanks, everybody, for paying attention and listening to us ramble on here. Uh, you can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can join our Facebook uh, Epic Collection group if you search for Epic Collections on Facebook. And I have a new YouTube channel if you search for Epic Marvel Podcast there. You can subscribe to my new uh, my new channel where I'll be uh, posting, hopefully soon, posting some cool videos. Uh, and other than that, I hope you all have a great day and we'll see you next time. See you, everybody.